Hi everyone. So welcome to uh, web a webinar organized by the blog and uh, presented by Chorus One. And uh, today, like the webinar, we're going to talk about institutional staking, and uh, we have three guests here at this webinar. So we have Felix from Chorus One, we have Boas from Anchorage, and Leela from Ledger Enterprise. So I guess we can have you guys introduce yourself and your company first, and then we can go through the, some of the questions regarding institutional staking one by one. Um, perhaps Felix, you can go first. Yeah, sounds great. Uh, thanks Eden for introducing us and thanks the blog for hosting. I'm uh, very excited to be here today with uh, Ledger and Anchorage. So um, a few words on me. I'm Felix Lutsch. I'm the chief commercial officer at Chorus One. Chorus One is a multi-chain staking provider. We're active on about 50 different networks. So what we do essentially is we run infrastructure for institutions and, and other players to participate in the decentralized networks that they invested in. And so, yeah, we do that uh, since five years um, and uh, haven't had a single slashing event. So yeah, excited uh, to uh, talk more about, you know, the service we offer or like the staking landscape in general today. Right, sounds good. Uh, Lila? Sure. Hi, everyone. I am uh, Lila Garcia. I'm Global Head of Customer Success Account Management at Ledger Enterprise. Uh, Ledger Enterprise essentially provides institutional grade um, self custody. So um, we provide the security and infrastructure for our end clients to do self custody. And in tandem, of course, we work with uh, partners to allow for um, staking, access to DeFi, um, additional trading capabilities, and we provide that technology layer um, underneath. Right, thanks. And Boas? Hi, thanks, Eden. Uh, thanks for having us. Um, I'm Boaz Avital. I am the head of product at Anchorage Digital. We're a regulated crypto platform for um, institutions like VCs, asset wealth managers, funds, protocols. We allow folks to buy digital assets, custody them, stake them, of course, uh, vote with them, and really just enable them to use them for what they're intended. Um, uniquely, in addition to having a incredibly safe and flexible custody technology. Anchorage Digital Bank is the only nationally chartered bank in all of crypto. Our federal charter from the OCC, uh, which regulates national banks in the United States, explicitly allows us to stake digital assets, um, which gives clients looking for qualified custody a level of uh, excellence and clarity and safety that they can't get anywhere else. And of course, we bring that around the world, um, like through the MAS to Singapore as well. Right, thank you. And you know, uh, to, when we took when you talk about you know uh, qualified custodians and and the legal side of things, we're going to talk about you know some of the you know legal implications of institutional staking um, at some point. Uh, but first, we're going to you know talk about the background of this topic. So, because like lately, we have seen an increase of uh, ether staked after the recent Chappelle upgrade where it enables um, the withdrawals of Ethereum, staked Ethereum. And there are some implications that institutions are more interested in staking Ether. So the first question for you guys would be, what were the challenges for institutional staking until now? And how do staking providers overcome these challenges? So, uh, Felix, maybe do you have something to share? Yeah, I can share like from our perspective, but I, I guess for sure it will be interesting to hear uh, the custodian side or like the custody side. So on our end, right, like I guess um, often we're pretty crypto native and like very close to the networks that we work with as a staking provider. And so we might like onboard networks earlier uh, as they sort of go to mainnet launch. On the other side, you know, I think institutions are generally obviously a little bit slower in terms of what they do in crypto and how they engage with it and need like more time to get comfortable with like, I guess, the asset class at large, but also with the different uses of, of the um, tokens. So for the longest time, I think the whole hold up was that most uh, like it took a while for even just holding 
and trading the assets, like sort of the first use cases to to be integrated in in different like platforms and sort of the institutions who get comfortable with even owning like Bitcoin or Ethereum in the first place. And then sort of the second thought is only, you know, how do you use it then? How do you generate yield on these assets and what's what sort of the risk you're, you're taking there? And um, I, I think now, especially in Ethereum, the way the Ethereum rollout worked, where essentially, you know, you first had just the ability to stake and the proof of work and the proof of stake chain were running in parallel, then it was just a proof of stake chain and then withdrawals were enabled sort of like this progressive um, a milestone based sort of approach then also like led to institutions becoming more comfortable as the final milestone the withdrawals were there because in the end, I guess an institution will be very hard to convince their board, their sort of uh, stakeholders to, to engage with something where you potentially couldn't get liquidity uh, on your, on your token. So there's nothing really we as a staking provider could do about that. Honestly, I guess there's liquid staking, which sort of provided a fix for this, but that had like other regulatory, like sort of implications as you're issuing a new token and there can still be problems with the liquidity there. So I think that, uh, and, and many people expected this, right? That the withdrawals become a big unlock for institutions. And I guess we're now also seeing this in the data. And um, as for how we, make it like easier for institutions, right? Our focus is, okay, we are actually vetted these networks before, like the institutions maybe engage with them. We build our infrastructure uh, to to be ready for when these players want to stake. So that means we're sort of hardening our infrastructure, testing the, the protocols, building our tools to make it easier to integrate staking and also providing like guarantees to uh, to them, to our partners in terms of how uh, we essentially guarantee our uptime or uh, insurance against slashing events, all things that we're probably going to talk about some more. So I'll, I'll, I'll pass over to uh, some of the others to, to maybe expand there. Yeah, I'm happy to jump in. Um, uh, I agree with Felix. Education really was, uh, was one of the big challenges earlier on in ETH. It was kind of late to the staking game. A lot of the, our clients were very used to the fairly liquid nature of staking and unstaking uh, that most assets have. And then, you know, they hear that ETH has staking and, but for two years, you know, it's a one directional uh, trip. And um, a lot of clients would come to us very interested in ETH staking, urgently wanting to ETH stake. And we would educate them on what that means right now, you know, before Chappella. Um, and they would be like, okay, maybe I'll wait actually. Um, now that that has changed, uh, um, definitely we're seeing a huge amount of interest uptake. Um, ETH is interesting. It still has, um, in some ways, more uncertainty, more indeterminism than other assets do. So now the next hurdle is like, okay, I can stake. Um, how long is that going to take? And when I withdraw, when am I going to get my assets back? Um, and we can only give guidelines, right? Because it depends on a lot of different factors. Um, how about Lila? Do you have anything to add? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, you know, I think that you're, you, Felix and Boaz are both right. I think, you know, prior to the Chappelle upgrade, um, you know, people were waiting to move into ETH staking, especially from the institutional side, um, mainly due to liquidity reasons and uncertainty of the queues, both entry and exit. Um, so, you know, if, if the question is, you know, what can you do as a staking provider to help your clients overcome those challenges? You know, I, I'd certainly look to Felix and, and his answer, but more so, I think, you know, we can all agree that education is the best thing. Thing. And as a staking provider or a custody provider, the best thing is to make sure your client is educated uh, uh, and aware of what it entails, whether regardless of the protocol, um, you know, specifically to ETH, obviously there's uh, nuances with the entry and execute. You can look at other protocols that have um, more complicated um, lockup periods. Uh, but I think the best thing is to make sure that they understand what what the strategy is exactly, how it will work, and then make sure that they're comfortable with um, exactly what it means and what the implications are for their end business. Right, thank you all. Because uh, so, so to summarize is uh, basically education really matters because of how novel and complex the Ethereum network is. Um, so like after the recent Chappella upgrade, like it really changes the dynamics and the mechanism a lot. And, uh, uh, as Boaz mentioned, a lot of institutions are now uh, become more become more interested in staking Ether. So maybe we can move on to 
you know, another question, so more on the financial side of things. So there are multiple sources of yields uh, or incomes in crypto. Uh, there, there's staking, there's, you know, DeFi, or even just trading or venture investments in crypto. But in your experience, why does an institution would choose to stake? Um, like Felix, perhaps? Yeah, uh, definitely. We, yeah, we are very interested in this topic. We've also written the post. I think I, I linked it actually in my sort of promotion for for this webinar that is like staking is the least uh, risky source of yield in crypto essentially because, so our opinion is that like, you know, staking is sort of the base layer function of the token, sort of the core functionality that the token provides and provides like sort of the base of, of yield and like a lot of the other uh, types of yield sort of build on top of that so you you're actually entering like additional risks for maybe you know like entering like into lending as well or even uh liquidity provisioning so these are like actually um more specialized i would say sort of uses that not every institution or not every holder is like set up to do i think we've also seen for example in liquidity provisioning passive liquidity provisioning that it's it's not working so well since like sophisticated actors will will do better and you you're faced with these issues like impermanent loss if the token prices sort of diverge so this actually are is things that um you know not, not everyone is able to handle efficiently and then staking is, is sort of like on the on the much simpler end of the spectrum of, of course you need to run the infrastructure but you have the options to uh work with partners like course one that will uh, handle like the technical parts for you and, and you're sort of just delegating your tokens so really your risk uh, there is taken away there's no like sort of impermanent loss of course you're still exposed to the token price but i guess as an investor or institutions that already hold the tokens generally are already exposed to that token price and like willingly do so so uh staking sort of just makes sure that you are the taking part in the network securing it and sort of um escape the the dilution that comes from the inflation of the tokens that that actually uh, sort of pay for the staking reward so if you're not participating in staking what actually happens to you is essentially you're taxed and you're you're basically diluted from people that do participate so uh as a as a holder you're you're actually sort of incentivized to to take part to uh, to keep up with that um yeah i think that's that's basically what we do and you can definitely check out the uh, the, for the listeners, the the blog post we wrote about that that also goes a little bit into you know the additional risks of like CFI that we actually have seen yeah quite a lot in the last year with like FTX and and stuff like that 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 maybe you know if you just look at the website of something like Celsius or FTX not so clear uh, what's happening in the background you maybe just see the number uh, but uh, there's obviously like a bunch of risks there uh, behind behind all the marketing so um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I would jump in and, and just say that uh, what Felix is saying is right. I mean, I think it's widely accepted that staking is um, the least risky way to earn additional income based off of your existing holdings. Obviously, when you look at DeFi, you're, you start going into smart contract interaction and there's risk associated with smart contracts and, um, you know, hacking. And then when you look at lending, et cetera, it's, there's, a, there's a whole other thing to consider when it comes to um, the way that you're... Um, underlying assets are being used. I think that when you consider staking too, it's not just a form of passive income, but it's really important to phrase it and to make the end client understand if they don't already that they're contributing back to the network itself. So it's not just passive network, but it's the belief in Ethereum or Polkadot or Cosmos, whatever it might be. And that by staking, you're contributing back to the network and therefore making it stronger um, in order for you know the network to then generate new blocks, et cetera. So it's also not just the passive income, but it's the belief in the network itself and the desire for it to be bigger and better um, going forward. So I think considering strategies um, overall, it's it's also important. I'd say it's definitely surprising almost. So we've, I've uh, been with Anchorage since we started six years ago, and um, I would not have guessed that staking would come out to be sort of like the interest equivalent uh, in terms of the, the type of the market that's interested in it as like treasury bonds. Um, but people really do view it as a, a much safer way to make your assets productive um, in addition to uh, 
like uh, Lila said, um, people who are altruistically interested in securing and supporting the network. Um, I, it wasn't a guarantee early on in the first staking protocols that this would happen. Um, clients were uh, extraordinarily concerned and uh, sort of risk aware of slashing risk um, and how that might happen and how to avoid it. Um, and it's you know only a testament to the amazing staking infrastructure that sort of popped up all around the globe um, that has made staking on every asset so reliable and slashing so um, rare that has allowed sort of this part of the ecosystem to sort of flourish and solidify so much. Yeah, thanks uh, for that. Uh, I, think, I think like to summarize, like like the risks of staking uh, is much more, you know, predictable or, you know, uh, much more understood in a way. So like, uh, you know, like a uh, smart contract could have, you know, a lot of smart contract risks uh, that are pretty unpredictable. Whereas, you know, staking like uh, is intrinsic to the blockchain and like the, the risks such as, you know, slashing and stuff, they are very well understood and well researched. And as long as you run an honest node um, or, you know, use a, you know, a high reputation, high reputation, you know, uh, custodians, uh, may, uh, your risks are very limited. Uh, so I guess that's like why, you know, institutions are very interested into, you know, staking. Um, so I guess we can move on to, you know, talking about, you know, the security size of, you know, staking. What sorts of, you know, protection measures does an institutional staking provider provide to these institutions when they stake? Um, Felix? Right, I, That's Felix's I, I, answer, I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess I'll, I'll take this one again. Uh, sorry, guys. I mean, yeah, feel free to, to add. I'm, I'm sure you guys have, like, uh, more there. But, I mean, for from our side, right, I guess there's, like, sort of broadly um, three topics like that we also that we go into I think um, as boss mentioned the slashing risk uh, sounds very scary at the start especially if you just hear about it okay you can like lose your funds can be taken away from you so there is a lot to say about that and I guess uh, over time you know as blockchain operates longer you also like realize okay this is actually not an event that happens often it's more um, sort of risky at the start potentially of, of a chain uh, and then you know it sort of over time becomes less of an issue as, as you said where it's mostly if you're actually like malicious or some mistakes that that you might make in your setup actually as a as a staking provider in terms of like you know hosting two nodes with the same key at the same time and accidentally bringing one up so this is generally how slashing penalties actually come about on the on the live chains or the slashing events that we have historically seen in the space are all sort of from um, staking providers that sort of messed up a little bit in their in their process of migrating to a different node or sort of uh, their availability setup. So one of the first things that that we care about generally is you know making sure that our setup is is avoids these sort of scenarios and that we have like a, a setup that has redundancy that has like different uh, nodes in different regions and different um, sort of. Uh, security measures, but also to make sure that, you know, it's, it's, it, it doesn't risk this, the double signing based on like, you know, two nodes coming up at the same time and, and competing over a block. So it's, it's really like uh, safety over liveness sort of. So you're, you're, you're okay. Maybe with going down for a few minutes, if you can make sure that you don't get slashed for double signing as a state provider. So this is just like the first thing. And then the other additional sort of guarantees that we bring to uh, people working with us and, and many other staking providers too. At, at this point, I, I guess it's sort of like become industry standard to also offer, you know, service level agreements in terms of how much uptime you provide and uh, then like uh, reimbursing the clients if, if that isn't met. Uh, so sort of standard uh, software business things. And then also on top of that, a very blockchain specific thing is, is the insurance. So, you know, slashing insurance, there's now as the market matures, as the data becomes better, and as there is like just more maturity in general, there's also like insurance providers that are uh, willing to take on maybe the small leftover risk of, of um, a slashing happening. And so you can uh, you know, offer this to your clients uh, to 
opt into like such an insurance. Um, and obviously, uh, if you're a provider that has a long standing, then this this might be um, the the uh, the insurance provider will be willing to you know insure that risk since they can like look into their operations. Maybe there's like certifications that. Uh, a provider can show or like other things uh, even like in the industry we actually had like some grassroots things like staking rewards uh, um, making this verified provider program where they sort of try to look at the provider holistically you know how big is their risk or things like that so there's a lot of factors coming together and then you can uh, sort of provide more guarantees to people that actually would work with you on the staking Felix mentioned a lot of things uh, to to vet and in terms of diligence. I mean, slashing insurance when that you know really starts to mature, I think is going to be the next big innovation. But insurance takes a really long time to be affordable. Um, as comfort levels have gone up, basically we've seen two things: very very sophisticated clients will have their own relationships with staking providers, um, or they're looking for sort of diversity and choice. Um, or they're very early in the network and they want to um, sort of distribute and decentralize as much as possible. Um, and for the majority of folks, they're looking to um, often us to their custodian, who they already trust with their assets at rest, to have the expertise um, to diligence and choose good staking partners. So we will um, look into that, it's look at all the factors that Felix mentioned have a deep relationship with, with staking providers like Chorus One, um, and then give clients the option to, to stake um, through essentially an Anchorage node um, at a place that we feel is safe and meets our technical bar. And Lila, do you have anything to add? No, I, I mean, I think these guys are, are generally, <laughs> hard to be the last one to answer the questions but you know i think everything is mentioned is right i think you know what what our institutional clients are asking of us is that we provide them with um, enterprise grade staking providers that will have slas api reporting capabilities and everything can be auditable so as we look at the institutional adoption within the market and the way that, um, you know, I hate to say it, the, the R word regulation, the way that we're moving as an industry, there's just going to be a greater need for advanced capabilities and um, as, you know, at scale. So as you look at the institutional adoption, particularly when you're talking a significant amount of assets, the demand is just going to be higher. So um, as we've been working with uh, some of our larger scale clients, um, of course, the testing starts, um, the demand for advanced reporting starts, and in tandem, that can be provided by the end staking provider or built in tandem in a partnership between us. Um, so it's really, you know, how we as the technology provider can then introduce them to the correct staking provider that will give them and correct, meaning the one that will give them what they need in terms of that reporting or API capabilities, the advanced capabilities that are going to allow them to stake um, with security and, and at scale. Right. Thank you. So, so basically, as things get more mature, um, you know, like uh, we, we get to see, you know, more redundancies uh, in the security of staking and, you know, hopefully the insurance, slashing insurance can be more affordable. Um, so moving on, uh, you know, as, you know, staking after all, it, it, it's already like a billion dollar business right now and it's just getting bigger and bigger. Uh, so do you think like the staking market is, commoditized and um, how does like a staking company generate generally you know differentiate itself from others in the space and how do you know institutions choose a staking provider um felix maybe maybe now the, the institutional <laughs> the others can answer first and then oh yeah, um, yeah, 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 yeah. Right, so, <laughs> give you um, I think everyone on this call as an infrastructure provider in this space um, is kind of wary of the, the industry's desire to jump to like calling things commoditized. I think it's part of the desire to want to feel like all of crypto and crypto infrastructure is very mature to say that one thing is the same as the other. But in reality, when you get down to the details, the details of custody, the details of staking, um, people are operating in very different ways. There's a risk if you think of the space as commoditized that as a client, 
you start trying to sort of check boxes instead of looking deeply into who your partner is, um, how they protect your assets, um, how they work and how they're going to serve you. And, um, and that's a situation where, you know, you start to treat two, two kinds of places to, to park your crypto as equal that don't end up being equal. And then I think we all learned that lesson really well in December. And so, um, you know, for staking providers specifically, um, you have to do the due diligence, right? You have to, the staking providers have to provide a good service. They have to deeply understand the asset, every asset. I mean, staking providers have a really hard job because every asset is unique in staking. It's not a standardized thing. Um, and there's new ways in which you can be the best at staking for every kind of digital asset that comes out. Um, so you have to do your research or, or, or trust someone who does. Yeah. I mean, I also think, I would say it's not commoditized. I, I don't think, you know, to Boaz's point, I don't think that we're in a mature enough market to have it be fully commoditized. And if you look at the total assets staked versus, um, you know, the, the total assets out there, we're still at a, you know, minority in terms of what could possibly be staked. I also think, you know, as we see, you know, at Ledger, we work with uh, a number of staking providers, both on retail and on enterprise. And, um, in doing our own research to find the right providers, you know, we've also noticed that certain providers are better at certain protocols than others, or, you know, there's a niche because Ethereum is this or Cosmos is that. And um, it's important for institutional clients to also, as Boaz mentioned, do their due diligence to figure out, depending on the strategy, depending on the size, depending on my end client, if they're, you know, working, if they're a custodian working with um, asset managers, who do I go for and why? And I think, you know, the same is goes for everyday life decisions. You don't go to the same store for, to buy everything. You'll go to this. Well, I'm, I'm in, I'm in France. So you'll go to the specialty stores to buy your meat and the, the, the fish or whatever, but um, it, it is, it is true. And I think that there's a lot of um, really good work being done by institutional staking providers and staking providers to make sure that um, they have the appropriate insurance in place. They have, you know, the infrastructure in place that makes the institutional client more comfortable. Um, but that of course comes along with an insurance and, and additional capabilities. One day we'll have a Walmart for staking. <laughs> well, you know, but then that's, it's not a fair game. And I think that the part of it is, is that, um, it, it's it's uh, we're we're in an industry where um, you know no two things look alike. But as to your point, you know we're three infrastructure providers within the industry, all doing similar but different things, um, and we probably offer similar services uh, to some extent, all three of us, but then very different services to another. So um, I think that's the competition makes us makes us stronger, and and uh, we've had enough of Walmart. <laughs> yeah. Uh now I'm in, in this last position. <laughs> I think, yeah, the, the 150 Costco custody plus staking uh, combo will, will come soon. But uh, no, I think, yeah, what, what both of you guys said is, is completely correct, right? I think we see also a proliferation of staking protocols or networks in general, and it's, it's quite hard for uh, like staking providers actually to choose which ones to focus on. So often you're sort of faced with a trade-off of like, okay, do I support like more networks or do I sort of go deeper on one? And, you know, you have seen some, uh, obviously like the, the big players, especially the venture back ones will try to like get a lot of coverage. Even us uh, have like followed this approach for a while, but then we also saw, okay, this is actually, um, you know, like overloading and, and it, it doesn't really work that well. So we like sort of went back a bit and focused on our, our core strengths. And you see is like some other providers that really did well in a like very specific ecosystem. Um, so I, I think, you know, we've invested a lot in like trying to find like in the research side, as was also earlier said, in terms of like trying to understand the networks, but also like almost from a venture perspective, like trying to grasp which ones will actually be successful to like support those and then provide the best service to, to our partners there. And, and we work very closely with uh, institutions, but also like VCs or crypto VCs to to be in touch with them to, we also have like, for example, the venture arm research to like sort of provide an, an entire package, also like sharing back our knowledge, what we see from actually operating these networks that can provide very valuable 
uh, insights to to people that maybe are like very far away, just give money once and sort of don't look at the network that much anymore. So I think that is also like a, a place where you can uh, differentiate in terms of, uh, you know, maybe like the value add that you bring on the side of research, on the side of ventures, on the side of MEV, a, a big topic where you could potentially like even improve the rewards of, of um, specific networks by running the, the infrastructure a bit better, which is obviously that's sort of the holy grail, I guess, from, for, from a safe private perspective, because people obviously are like thinking of it as commodified because they think, okay, everyone is sort of doing the same. We, I earn the same. So you, you can't really charge fee on it. I guess that's might be like one view, but there, there are definitely like avenues that you can explore uh, as it's such a, you know, wide space to, to sort of focus on, on certain things and, and be doing well there and then um, find your partners that you can work with and um, uh, yeah, um, provide a differentiated service. Right. So, so to summarize, like uh, staking is like very diverse because, like you know, there are many different chains and there are a lot of competition in this space as well. So, like uh, we're gonna see, you know, different staking providers sort of trying to specialize in different, say, different blockchain or you know, different uh, different subspace, and uh, maybe they would try to you know cater to different target audience as well. Um, so moving on, so uh, what are some upcoming trends in the staking industry in the upcoming year? Um, yeah, one. I can. I'll, I'll, I'll go first again for this one. I think, um, yeah, so we've we've always been like very interested. I, I guess I, I mentioned this earlier that uh, we try to be very close to the market and how it's moving. And I think, you know, we've seen the big trend liquid staking sort of be uh front and center over the last two years especially because of the missing withdrawals in ethereum and sort of the the missing delegation mechanism even that that sort of led to a lot of adoption of liquid staking protocols like lido on on ethereum and then sort of the proliferation of this idea of liquid staking to to other uh, networks and domains and um so right now i think there's like sort of an expansion of that thought because i guess initially staking was somewhat separate from the DeFi market. So you had the DeFi degens, like the people more on Ethereum uh, that use like Aave, Compound, and this sort of DeFi summer with yield farming and whatnot. And you had the staking market, which was, which was always a bit more uh, like slower and like different and more infrastructure focused. And through liquid staking, these two kind of came together. And I think that's like a trend that's certainly continuing where you know, financial products, sort of financial engineering with staking as like a sort of building block is certainly something that we see much more uh, nowadays in different ways. You can think of uh, maybe like staking, hedge staking positions that allow you to um, sort of combine maybe the options with staking and, and sort of limit your downside. Uh, so I think that's one direction. And then also just generally this new idea of re restaking or basically reusing the collateral that you put up for staking for other purposes. I guess that's always like sort of a trend that the capital market has to, to sort of be more capital efficient, to use your, your, your funds in, in the most capital efficient way. And I guess restaking sort of plays on that by saying, okay, you can reuse that security that you provide to Ethereum or like some other network by also like running some additional, uh, other services and earning extra yield, but also taking on extra risk for that. And sort of there, I yeah, with, with like Eigenlayer now also raising like a big round and sort of, um, I guess, spearheading that, that trend, that sort of direction, I, I guess there's going to be a lot happening there. And that's also, again, I guess maybe going back a little bit to the previous question, also potentially like an avenue where staking providers could um, differentiate by like sort of offering different uh, risk packages, different like sort of strategies for depending on the client profile. I, I would jump in and say, you know, trends for the year ahead, we also have to look at where we are and, and unfortunately look a little bit back to what happened, you know, six months over the course of the last year. And unfortunately, you know, with the recent bank failures in the US and uh, with the way that the markets have moved, I think that the traditional investor 
um, whether crypto native or not, they're still looking at sort of like the hard assets being Bitcoin or even short term treasuries going back to that point earlier. Um, and what we're seeing from a ledger standpoint is still that focus on the top five or top 10 in terms of market cap or volume. Um, so while, you know, Ethereum benefited from the Chappella upgrade and we have, you know, some staking yields generally like average around 11, some a little bit outliers like Polkadot or Cosmos maybe um, with much higher yields. I do think that what we're going to see this year is a slow but steady adoption um, and we're going to continue a, a, a fairly concentrated focus on the top, maybe let's say 10. So I do think that there's going to be more diverse ways in which you can stake, whether it's through liquid staking or whether it's using different ways to leverage your staked assets, et cetera. Um, but when you look at total institutional adoption and then where they're going, I think it's going to be remain um, probably um, slow and steady uh, for the next six months at least. Could be big, but steady. <laughs> um. I'll just zoom out since we covered like the all, all the things that we think are going to happen. The the um, the thing that I'm always most excited about in the crypto industry is the um, the rapid innovation from people you know way smarter than mm -hmm. I will ever be around like the things that can be built. You look, for example, at AMMs, right, and like the level of complexity that a small team in Uniswap took an increase from V1 to V3 and going beyond. Um, these are, these are you know, very, very complex topics that are not easy to understand. And liquid staking, you know, was this sort of like straightforward concept that's gonna be the first step in a lot of very complex things that are happening. I think restaking is the sort of first example of this where now, the second largest crypto network, the second largest like pool of value is comfortable in, in being used to stake. And it's a pretty you know, complex set of systems that allows you to share security now across different chains. Um, the layers of complexity will only be added on and they'll be added on independently. And then people will have to look back and say, how is, how are, is risk colliding? How do these things interact with one another? And we'll build more and more systems. Um, it's going to be a really, really interesting time with, uh, you know, a lot of papers uh, and math to write um, that says, where is this industry going to go to be like the most efficient, to grow the fastest, to provide actual value? Yeah, I mean, I'll just say one more thing to that point. If you look back six six months ago, and then for those of us that have been in the industry for a little bit longer, um, even over the course of the past two years, the 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 changes within the market, within the innovation, within the failures, within the big wins. I mean, they can happen very quickly, and they can change the course of how the institutional um, market moves. So, you know, I think Boaz is right. We. we you never know. <laughs> but uh, certainly innovation will come and I think continue to drive the markets in a way that um, we can't yet foresee. Right, thanks. So in a nutshell, you know, innovation has been happening uh, in the background fast. Um, uh, as you guys mentioned, adoption would happen uh, slow and steady. But of course, like as the econo economy, you know, improves, uh, it will come. Uh, and by then, uh, the, the innovation would have been there. So like uh, we would have, you know, uh, had a lot of, you know, more infrastructure already in place and, you know, to embrace uh, more adoption from, you know, both retail and institutions. And uh, moving on to probably the regulatory side. So there have been some new rules around, you know, qualified custodians of digital assets that was released by the SEC recently. So do you think it is positive or negative for the industry? And uh, how would they impact the institutions that partner with custodians? So maybe uh, I'll let Boaz answer this first. Um, yeah, of course. Um, much of the proposed rule, um, I don't know if you've read all 400 pages of it, um, really reaffirms a lot of the stuff that's been happening already. Um, there's some additional 
provisions for, you know, ensuring that RAAs keep all assets with qualified custodians and things that were, you know, probably more or less already happening. Um, but um, the most important part is that it continues to reaffirm clients need to keep assets segregated. They need to keep assets bankruptcy remote. Um, they need to continue to look out for their customers um, in the best possible way to avoid systemic failure. The reason why, you know, qualified custodians exist in the first place. Um, it's the reason why we decided to pursue a federal banking charter. Um, it allowed us to unequivocally meet the definition of a qualified custodian. Um, it's, you know, a big task to be a, a national bank, um, but it's one that we feel the industry needs and needs more of. Um, we're proud to support institutional clients in that way. And we've made comments on the rule as have others. Um, and we're looking forward to it sort of like ending up in a place that can be well supported and support the industry. I, I would say here, I mean, I think that I did not read the 400 pages. <laughs> I read some of them, but not all 400. But I would say, you know, if you look at the industry and you look at the institutional investor, they're focused on their core business, which is whichever strategy they're deciding to roll out. They shouldn't be worried about where their money sits, whether it's, um, you know, being traded elsewhere, w w if it's actually being, you know, who's touching it, wherever. I think, unfortunately, regulation ha makes everyone think, oh, you know, what a pain, you know, there's more hoops to jump through. But I think at the end of the day, the intent is to hold the industry to a higher standard. And if that means segregated ass assets and yearly audits, then so be it, because that then enables our end clients, the institutional clients or investors to be able to focus on their core business without having the custody, uh, whether it's a, you know, custo regulated custodian or, uh, you know, the technology layer or, you know, a staking provider be the question mark in their strategy, right? Uh, we as infrastructure sh providers should be the sure thing. And if that means as a regulated custodian, you have to go through additional audits, then so be it. Because again, it's important to hold the industry to a higher standard and make sure that, you know, the likes of FTX doesn't happen again. Let's just say, you know, it was there's many reasons why they failed, but at the end of the day, there weren't the appropriate audits, uh, audits. There was not the transparency that was needed, and there was no regulation that was, you know, prohibiting them from doing what they were doing, which was the poor um, handling of their client assets. So I think, you know, if we can take a step up and collectively say, yes, we're all in this together and, you know, bring on the audits. Um, luckily, I'm not on that team. But, um, you know, I think it just allows our RN client to be more focused on their business and make more money and in tandem, um, you know, all of us to be more successful. Yeah, uh, certainly agree with all of those. I didn't read the 400 pages either. I'll, I'll paste it into ChatGPT and that's the uh, homework for yeah. the <laughs> listening. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So I mean, I think, yeah, regulation in general, I guess, you know, in the end, it's kind of clear why there's also like a bigger push now, obviously, given what the market has experienced with FTX and, and Terra and these wronggoings. And then I think there can also be like a drive to overregulate in, in some sense following these, since I guess uh, maybe that's seen as a solution. And maybe that gets also more support from the wider public that lost money in, in sort of these uh, circumstance that I, I think, yeah, it's a very uh, tough topic. Uh, I think in general, um, I'm personally a fan of putting the things more on chain, right? Like, so using what the blockchain is there for to make it like more auditable to make the, bring the transparency through that uh, dimension to, to use like systems that are like open source and vetted by, um, you know, different people instead of like uh, hiding it behind like your, I don't know, uh, QuickBooks or whatever FTX was using and uh, not not like having much infrastructure at all there. Uh, so I'm I'm sort of on that side, but I guess then you have the issue that there is also like a certain degree of, um, you know, historical significance or maybe also, you know, like privacy that you don't yet have, can yet have on chain. And, and so uh, there will be, I guess, um, you know, some sort of hybrid 
uh, thing there needed probably for a long time. And many people might not be ever comfortable to be fully on chain themselves. Uh, so I do see that uh, there will always be a role for, for like a qualified custodian to like sort of make it provide the access to um, um, clients that maybe not as technically savvy, but then ideally, yeah, obviously these, these parties should be uh, thoroughly vetted and thoroughly like, um, um, yeah, audited to to really ensure that the service they're providing is of the quality that that's on their website, I guess. And uh, yeah, I guess that that's where it sort of failed in the past. And I mean, the, the path at Anchorage, for example, has taken, or also like Ledger in France, with in like jurisdictions that are more, um, I guess, also established versus like you know having some entity in the Bahamas where there's maybe not as much scrutiny on your uh, processes. That's that's certainly like something to also look out for as a person. That that like let's say a high net worth individual or someone that that wants to custody their assets somewhere um, to to uh, consider. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So, so basically, to summarize, uh, you know, uh, when it comes to you know the custody of uh, financial assets, regulations are required so that you know investors can um, you know worry about you know the investing side of things instead of you know worrying about the custody of their assets. So, uh, and we are seeing a lot of, you know, institutions who have been engaging with uh, the regulatory parties in terms of uh, regulations uh, like SEC or you know, CFTC in the United States and also other, you know, related agencies in other jurisdictions as well. Uh, so uh, since we're talking about custody, we can move on to talk about like self-custody. So, uh, you know, there were some hints of, Hardware wallets like Ledger seeing a huge spike in sales after the FTX collapse and other similar situations. So, do you think this trend of self custody, uh, this trend of self custody, is going to continue? Uh, and do you think like people finally realize the importance of self custody? And uh, what are some of the bottlenecks the industry would have to resolve? before self-custody becomes more mainstream? Yeah, full transparency, you know, we had our best couple of months after the FTX uh, fallout on the retail business because people were buying nanos, people got scared. And, you know, finally, I think the retail market was waking up a little bit and realizing where are my assets sitting and with whom and what's being done with them. Um, so while it was, uh, good trigger event for ledger um, retail sales. I mean, uh, the ledger enterprise or, you know, global ledger, we're not celebrating what happened with FTX. Um, if anything, it's a rude awakening that there's a huge educational gap in the market still, um, both on the retail and the institutional side, uh, probably more so on the retail side, um, just by the nature of the business. But you know, I think that it draws to light that we, again, as, you know, institutional um, infrastructure providers need to help facilitate our clients with that educational piece. And we see it because, um, you know, at Ledger Enterprise, we provide self-custody. Again, it's an infrastructure layer that provides um, self-custody for our end clients. We are not a regulated custodian Um we do not have access to the funds, nor do we touch them. Uh, we have a lot of clients that are regulated custodians. We have clients that are exchanges, hedge funds, asset managers, corporates. Um, and if you take the corporate use case, uh, you know, well, a lot of um, brands or corporates are saying, you know, let's add digital assets to our balance sheet and, you know, let's start self-custody and what does this actually mean? And it, it you see there's a big gap in the crypto natives and then people entering into the space, whether you're, you know, a TradFi hedge fund or you're a corporate or a brand that's looking to do an NFT um, brand strategy. Um, and I think it just really brought to light after FTX sort of where the gaps are and how we collectively as an industry need to do better to make sure that people are making smarter decisions. And that also means choosing the right partners, whether it is a regulated custodian or a custody provider to do self-custody, um, making sure that when they're staking, they're using, you know, vetted, uh, you know, enterprise grade staking services um, and not just, you know, picking the, the first thing off the shelf. Absolutely. Um, I think, you know, 
I think self custody, the fact that self custody can even exist is a testament to the value proposition of the industry that we're in. Um, and that people can do the things that they want to do um, with their assets and, and interact on chain. Um, the there will always be a need for self custody uh, and people who want to self custody and there will always be a need for um, third parties, um, regulated banks um, or other institutional custodians um, that hold your assets that do some of that work for you um, and that you know help you or you, you're sometimes required to use because you're holding other people's money and you're a regulation, you're a regulated institution yourself. Um, the, the important thing is that, like Lila said, people find the right solution for them, that institutions find the solution that makes the most sense for their structure, for their capabilities, for their risk tolerance, um, for what it is that they want to do. Um, and that way we'll be able to sort of grow and actually get the benefits that we're all you know looking to bring. I'll just add to that, um, and sorry to jump in, Felix, but I think that following FTX, the main thing that we've seen at Ledger is not just you know the understanding, better understanding of self custody. At least you know after the nano sales went through the roof, that was great. Um, but there's a shift in the market and how people are securing their digital assets, and again, whether it's through regulated custodian or not, or infrastructure provider or not, but most notably off exchange. And so there's a way that people are now changing their approach to how they are trading, interacting with the greater ecosystem. And that is, I think, you know, a, a good move in the right direction. The exchanges will continue to make money off of transaction fees. So, you know, I don't feel bad for them. Um, but, you know, if it, it's, it's an, an awakening in the market and you see the way that the market has shifted in terms of where clients are putting their assets and how they're treating them. It was a very meaningful shift in, you know, traditional clients who are come from the traditional industry and who are sort of begrudgingly working in this, um, you know, weird world where you give your assets away before to somebody else, um, before you can trade them or use them or anything like that. Um, and now, you know, there's a lot more um, momentum around doing things what we view as the right way and the safe way and, you know, in many ways the way the sort of like lower trust way that is um, sort of the part of the MO of the way crypto should be operating. Yeah, I certainly agree that like self custody is extremely important to have around and to use because, but it's also, you know, there are trade offs and it's very hard to do. I mean, I think, you know, we saw last week also like what Lila mentioned that, you know, the, the way people store their assets are getting more like, uh, thinking about, you know, what is actually happening. I think also when Ledger introduced this recovery feature, you know, there was a big like outcry now, you know, what's happening there and trying to understand hardware wallets better, how they actually work. I think, you know, in the end, cryptography is a pretty tough topic. And uh, the, the the seed phrase question of like, how do you store it and how do I, how can I like make sure on my own to not lose it and, and sort of for providers or like for um firms to find ways around that. I think ledger recovery is like the, the right idea actually in, in, in some ways to to sort of try and help people to still be able to recover it since otherwise you won't be able to onboard billions of users if, if, they, if they they have to like rem keep their seed phrase safe. And um, yeah, I guess there's, there's a lot of innovation in that space in general, I would say also with like MPC and other cryptography uh, tools to like and and smart contract wallets helping you sort of maybe having like different signers on 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 the chain and and sort of creating some more redundancy there i guess that's also like part of any custodian's sort of infrastructure as well probably even like more sophisticated and uh, um uh, i think um you know as as was said it will depend a little bit on the client and what you're trying to do and what the optimal solution is for you in terms of also like what you're comfortable with what you're legally able to use and and sort of all all these factors together then probably lead you somewhere or or also like you'll you'll have a mix of of things right like i guess many people probably do some self custody also have some money on the exchange and and sort of end up with a with a mix which is also probably not ideal for the uh 
a like, common customer that, that probably wants to just have one place. But I think from personal experience, also like having these different chains and everything, you, you sort of end up with a lot of the different setups and, and that um, might mean, yeah, that, that, you know, like a, one solution fits better on a certain a network than, than on another. And um, I guess it's the same as we discussed earlier with the staking providers, like maybe the maturity is also not fully there yet where um, you, you don't have one thing that, that, that works everywhere perfectly well. Uh, but I guess, yeah, we'll, we'll also get there. So I said that the R word was regulation and you went and said the R word recovery. <laughs> recovery. <laughs> uh, but no, I think the, the I think the point is and, and what we seem to agree on is in fact there's no one size fits all for the institutional client or you know much less for the retail client. Um, and I think that the at the end of the day the client needs to choose the right partner for them and if they happen to be a specialist in staking then go build you know your own nodes and and run them. Um, if you have your own custody infrastructure and you have the bandwidth to maintain that at scale, then, you know, continue to do that in tandem with whatever your other operations are. But if you can't, or you recognize that you are not an expert in that particular piece, then you partner with the, those people that can help facilitate um, your end business or make your life easier because you're saving time and, and focusing on something else. Right. Thank you. So basically uh, crypto offers optionalities to, you know, uh, uh, how you, choose to store your crypto assets uh, from, you know, self-custody like hardware wallets to, you know, using qualified custodians. So, you know, as you guys mentioned, there's no one size fit all. Um, you know, uh, there are just so many options out there. Uh, so hopefully, you know, like different uh, participants can choose uh, whatever that fits them. Um, so moving on, uh, so let's talk again about uh, some kind of regulatory actions that happened recently. So uh, as you know, SUC uh, like uh, sent a notice to Kraken uh, and, and they had like a settlement re regarding like uh, Kraken's staking product. So how has this recent SEC notice to Kraken impacted the staking industry? Yeah, I guess um, it's interesting. It's uh, like a two-sided sword, right? Like any publicity is also a good one. So I definitely think more people uh, think about staking or looked at staking after this. I think also um, it's sort of interesting how they came after staking in a way. I, I, I don't really uh, see uh, how, yeah, sorry. I mean, like, I think it's important to note that they, that it's not staking that is, ah, that was yeah. at issue here, right? It was, yeah the structure and the marketing of a staking as a service program. Um, and, you know, in many ways, that's their job. So their problem was staking services offered to the general public, pooled assets, um, the way in which those were accounted, the where liability lied, who was doing the work. These were all things that have definitions. Um, the uh, it, it does not mean that you know, institutions can't stake. Um, and it certainly, you know, doesn't mean that you can't stake, you know, the assets that you hold um, in your bank, in your custody provider, in your ledger, whatever it is. And so um, yeah, that's, I think that's the key thing is that people understand sort of sophisticated institutions understand um, that there isn't risk in staking um, to them and that, um, the you know why we specifically have staking written into our national banking charter so for us staking is a federally regulated activity already right yeah definitely i think uh, definitely make sure that, i guess the the pooling element of it was like key to this discussion in a way where you know you can still always directly stake definitely that that is not the thing that was at at like you know, uh, put to the test there. I think, you know, in the end, actually the product that these exchanges sort of offered did create like, it's, it's like more competitive almost than, you know, the direct staking because you need like 32 ETH in Ethereum to stake. And that's obviously maybe not like what everyone can have. And you can sort of gain some other advantages by sort of pulling together. But uh, I guess it's actually interesting that, that this has happened because that actually puts, 
yeah, you know, direct staking back again on a, like a more level playing field where it gets more attractive again since these services are not available anymore, but you still have like liquid staking solutions that sort of do the same thing, but just on chain. So it's like more transparent and, um, you know, more auditable there, what happens in, in the liquid staking pools or potentially like not always that's the case actually either. So, um, I do think that, um, you know, in general, I guess it, it didn't, I think it was like maybe also overshadowed a bit by then also like, um, you know, withdrawals going live and people uh, becoming interested in staking generally. And, and then uh, I don't, I didn't see like a downturn of, of interest in staking from, from that, aside from like the general market generally being uh, not, not so uh, bullish right now. But I, I guess generally, uh, if you look at the numbers in ETH staking, right, if you just look at how much more ETH is being staked, then that's certainly on, didn't slow down the growth. Um, From a ledger enterprise standpoint, we did see, you know, some clients put their U.S. staking operations on hold completely. I mean, it's the nature of what happens when the SEC comes down and says, whoa, 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 you know, make sure this is clean. People reassess their strategy and, and want to make sure that their investments are, in fact, clean and doing what, you know, they anticipate that they should be doing and will be doing. Um, so I think... It's not necessarily a setback, but it's, again, goes back to that educational piece. And if you're entering into strategy, it's important that you know exactly where your assets are, um, you know, where they are in the blockchain, who's holding them, who has access to them. Um, and to Boaz's point, how they're marketed, you know, what exactly is this instrument that is unregulated and, um, you know, not commoditized at this point in time. Um, and this is why we're here, because, you know, crypto is a wonderful industry and we're, we're, we're still living on the cost of innovation, innovation. But um, it's important that, you know, when you're entering a strategy, exactly what's being done with your assets. Right. Thank you. Uh, so we kind of running out of time. So uh, let's wrap it up and... Um... So like a one last quick question. So, uh, so I guess like, uh, what does your company uh, do to ensure the best execution uh, that can be provided to your clients? So like, it's a pretty open-ended question. So, uh, so hopefully you can, you know, answer whatever that you feel like. Sure. I mean, I'll go. Why not? Um, I think at Ledger Enterprise, our, our core value is security at scale. And so as we look forward into the year ahead and, you know, we're almost at um, the end of H1, um, we are certainly looking to innovate, to continue to build, but we do it cautiously and we do it to make sure that when we deliver a product, there's going to be the security and then the ease of use, which is what's going to drive the institutional adoption, whether you're talking about staking or, you know, trading or whatever capability it is. So I think we're going to continue um, innovating, continue building for the year ahead. And as always with caution um, and cautiously and conscious of our end investor, um, excuse me, clients, the institutional investors, um, because what they're looking for is making sure, you know, whatever strategy it is or whatever provider it is that they're using, um, it's secure. And that's not the question mark in their business. Um, yeah, I, uh, I really believe that um, in this industry, we don't have enough focus on individual clients sort of workflows and operations and the way in which they're actually trying to provide their own sort of gain their own value. Lila said something really interesting earlier, which is like every institution has the thing that they're good at and are trying to do, and they shouldn't have to do everything else as well. Um, at Anchorage, we really focus, you know, the way I like to think about it is we focus on, on three kinds of safety, three kinds of clarity for, for clients that are important in order for them to feel comfortable with crypto. The first and sort of prerequisite to all of it is technical safety. Are your assets actually in safe custody um, that cannot be compromised, um, cannot be made mistakes by humans, um, cannot you know do a thing that you don't want it to do or your organization doesn't want it to do? And that's the first part. The second part is regulatory safety or at least regulatory clarity a thing that is sorely lacking in this industry um, and bars that, that truly need to be met so that a whole side of your organization whose job it is to reduce your risk feels comfortable. Um, and the third is operational uh, excellence. 
um, your the people who are doing the job every single day. Um, can they do the job? Can they use your platform to accomplish things they want to accomplish and do it in less time so that you can do more? And those are the ways in which we try to make our clients as successful as possible. Yeah, awesome answer. Yeah, I think uh, I'll I'll just like sort of talk about our values at Chorus One that we sort of embed in the organization at large and then also like sort of into our services and products and, and how we interact with clients. So these are like radical transparency. So for one, we try to like internally, like a lot of our processes are like clear who is in power, where, where, where does stuff sit? And we try to like also be transparent with our clients or with the space at large about our opinions on things, our infrastructure, how we run it to the extent possible, right? Like obviously you don't want to like maybe just say exactly where your uh, server sits or, or, or things like that. But uh, so that's, that's one of the values. The other one is uh, excellence and continuous improvement. So we're trying to uh, get better at what we do uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. That means, you know, like being highly available in our sense with the infrastructure, making the integration of staking services seamless for our um, clients or, or even just, you know, learning every day new things about what's happening in the space on the research side. And then finally, generosity and kindness. This is probably like less relevant, but it's like for us pretty important that we want to create a like also working culture that's like nice for the the people working there and like a long term sustainable um, sort of company that that you know is um, like uh, generous in terms of like the time spent for for your client for your help that you help your clients or also your colleagues and um, yeah so. Um, you can also read these on our website if you want to and like the expansion, but uh, thanks so much for uh, for um, asking about that. And uh, yeah, thanks for hosting us, Eden. I guess this is potentially the last uh, question we'll have, uh, or can we still get onto the yeah. audience things? Probably not, right? Yeah, I think we kind of overran a bit and we, we have actually answered up, you know, some of the questions there. So uh, uh, maybe we can, you know, uh, end here and, uh, Again, thanks again for, you know, Felix, Lila and Boaz for your for time and for coming here, you know, answering a lot of questions regarding institutional staking. And uh, as we see like the space getting more mature, we're going to see much more demand in this space. And uh, yeah, hopefully we can talk about this topic sometime later. Yeah, let's do it again right. in six months and see where we are. <laughs> yeah. It was a pleasure. Thank, thank you, you guys very the... much for having us. Yeah, and thank you for the audience for, you know, joining us today uh, at this webinar. And hopefully we can see you all again later. Thanks for having us. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.